Hello, welcome everybody to this edition of Hardman Talks. We're pleased to be joined today by the management team of the City of London Investment Group. We're going to give a short presentation on their results uh, and then answer questions about them. Uh, let me hand over to the Chief Executive, Tom Griffith. Tom, over to you. Thank you, Keith. And thank you to everyone that's taken the time to be with us here today. We really appreciate the opportunity to be here and to share information about City of London Investment Group with all of you. There will be four of us participating in the presentation today. Myself, Tom Griffith, the CEO, Mark Dwyer, the CIO, Carlos Uste, the Head of Business Development, and Deep Agrawal, who as recently announced is the CFO. Mark, Carlos, and I have been working together for over 20 years and are all executive directors on the group board. Deep joined us in January of 2020, following a 20-year career in the auditing field and has been a great addition to our management team. Our plan today is for me to provide some background on the company. Deep will walk us through our financial highlights, dividend and cover policy, and guidance template. Carlos will provide details on our recent merger with Carpus Investment Management and overview of our strategies. And Mark will then provide further details on strategies, performance, and flows. On the next page is a snapshot as of calendar year end. City of London Investment Group, or CLIG, is an asset management business with just under 11 billion of funds under management as of the end of the calendar year. CLIG has two operating subsidiaries, City of London Investment Management or CLIM and Carpus Investment Management or KIM that are each fully integrated investment management businesses. As we have both existing shareholders and other interested parties on the call, I'd like to briefly provide some background uh, to the business. The Klim business was founded by Barry Olaf in 1991 as a specialist emerging markets equity manager, utilizing closed end funds as the investment vehicle. Klig originally listed on AIM in 2006 and moved to a full listing in 2010. Historically since listing, Klig has been considered a small-ish size business from a listing perspective with a market cap of circa 120 million sterling, making it difficult for a number of investors to consider investing in us. To this end, uh, diversification has been a goal for a number of years to provide earnings stability, to enlarge the market cap, to ultimately increase liquidity, to continue remaining independent, and to continue motivating employees who want to be part of a growing organization. That diversification at the CLIM level has included organic diversification by applying the success of our emerging strategy to the additional market segments. Uh, we've been successful with this diversification to varying degrees with a frontier or pre-emerging strategy, an international strategy, and an opportunistic value go anywhere strategy. We've also um, added a, an experienced uh, resource, two, two man team experienced resource um, that manage a uh, REIT strategy. We seeded those strategies in January of 2019 and now have a two year track record. There's both an emerging and an international strategy under the REIT umbrella. We also attempted diversification at the CLIG level for many years without success until recently. On 1st October 2020, CLIG merged with uh, uh, Kim in an all share deal, effectively doubling the market cap of CLIG. Kim is a business that was uniquely positioned to merge with CLIG. Similar to Klim, uh, George Karpus founded Kim over 30 years ago. Kim is an investment management firm utilizes closed end funds in its investment process and clients are high net worth investors in the US. Funds under management of the combined entity as of 1st October, 2020 was 9.5 billion. 
And as I mentioned earlier, as of the 31st December 2020, with the benefit of rising markets, the combined entities funds under management were just under 11 billion. Both entities, Klim and Kim, are standalone investment management firms, utilize closed end funds in their investment process, have a long track record of outperformance, and have a team approach to investing. And uh, Klim and Kim are also complementary businesses. Klim's business is institutional, while Kim's client base is primarily high net worth or retail investors. And Klim is primarily equity focused, while Kim focuses on fixed income or balanced mandates. On the next page, we provide some background on how we run the business. Our business has three constituents or, sh or stakeholders, shareholders who own the business, employees who manage the business, and clients who pay the bills. Our responsibility is to keep these three stakeholders in balance by avoiding conflicts and to ensure that each of their interests is safeguarded. The main driver of our business is performance for our existing clients and also to attract new clients. As an active manager, our job is to add value over and above a relevant benchmark through an investment cycle, which we define as five years. To be successful, we need to retain employees that are successful in managing the business. We need to increase funds under management over time, control costs, and enhance shareholder value through business growth and diversification. We remain available and accountable to our shareholders and accept responsibility for and within the communities where we conduct business. With that, I'll pass over to Deep to review the group's financial highlights. So this slide is uh, the real financial highlights for uh, our six months ended uh, 31st December. Uh, as you can see, the PBT, statutory PBT uh, was 8.8 .8 million, uh, but the underlying PBT was actually 11.2. Um, adjustments being uh, for the amortization of the intangibles acquired on merger, um, the merger related costs primarily, and some in uh, investment gains. The underlying EPS as at the end of December uh, 2020 was 23.8 P. Uh, the next slide is our dividend policy. Uh, basically, this slide shows our dividend policy uh, uh, of uh, 1.2 times cover uh, over the rolling five-year period. As you can see that we've been meeting that cover for last four years. And um, as it was announced earlier in January, uh, we have increased our dividend by 10% to uh, 11p as our interim, which will be paid out in March. <clears throat> and finally, um, this is uh, what we call it as a dividend cover uh, slide, which is basically included in, which is included in our uh, interim report as well. And this basically tries to show our dividend break even. Um, as as you can see in the slides, the yellow bars are the actual still 31st of December, and blue are our projections. Um, the the, our assumptions uh, we use to create this slide is um, are mentioned towards the bottom of the. Uh, slide which are quite conservative and the uh, blue line growing across uh, is our dividend break even at the current dividend of 31p and as you can see there is um, substantial headroom uh, which is depicted by the blue blue bars there uh, i will now hand over to carlos to talk about the kim merger please good afternoon everyone thank you deep um, this slide uh, goes over some of the details in terms of the transaction, the merger with uh, with Kim between Clegg and Kim. As Tom noted earlier, uh, Kim is now a wholly owned subsidiary of Clegg. We now have two operating subsidiaries, so Kim sits alongside um, Klim. Um, the key points here uh, in terms of the actual deal itself. We had an all share transaction. Uh, you can see the consideration there. Um, the Kim shareholders, this is the, the, the management team as well as uh, George Karpis, uh, the founder of Kim, um, own approximately 48% of Clig. Uh, we then issued 24.1 million new shares uh, at closing. 
Um, we have George Carpus and his concert party owning about 38%, which is George Carpus and his family members. Uh, there is a lockup agreement in place for 12 months, so that's a hard lockup, uh, and then subsequently 12 months soft lockup subject to orderly markets. Uh, I think the key thing from the merger is that the group now uh, has consolidated its presence in the United States and is able to offer clients both in terms of institutional clients, which has been the historical uh, strength of, uh, of CLIM, as well as now wealth management clients. Um, so those underlying clients are high net worth, um, certain pension funds, and then um, uh, some retail uh, clients as well in terms of providing that asset class diversification. Uh, and I think as, as mentioned earlier by Deep, uh, the group dividend policy remains unchanged. Uh, in terms of the integration status, um, obviously we have been operating within the constraints of the COVID um, protocols uh, here in the United States and the various interstate uh, rules in terms of travel and, and those restrictions on travel. Um, it has made things a little bit more difficult uh, insofar as we have not been able to deploy a full integration team to Rochester. But at the same time, we've also been able to leverage, uh, obviously, uh, virtual tools, whether it's video conferencing uh, or the ability to remotely um, get into various systems. And I think that that's something that, uh, you know, the firm has been investing in for um, the last five years. And so we were ready at the point that we had to move to working remotely. Uh, one of the key things about the firm is that we've always um, had uh, work from home policies. We've always been um, working very hard on disaster recovery. And so it really didn't pose a problem for the group. And what we've done now is through this integration on the, in, the uh, information technology side or the IT side, we've been able to put in place um, some of the tools that we use at CLIM, now at KIM, to enable the staff to fully leverage working from home. Uh, and then secondly, we've been able to improve the infrastructure there on the IT side. Uh, I think the other um, important area that has been integrated is the finance function under Deep. Uh, he's worked very closely with um, uh, Kathy Crane, who is the CFO at Carpus, uh, and, and with her team to ensure that, um, you know, moving uh, Kim from a private US-based um, company to a subsidiary, obviously, of uh, UK PLC. And that's really where we've uh, where we focus time and effort, and those are the two areas where this integration has really taken place. Um, Tom and I have joined the Kim board, so the subsidiary board, alongside uh, Kathy Crane, the CFO, and Dan Lippincott, the uh, CIO, and we've really been focused on ensuring that the investment teams remain independent, but in the background, we're working operationally to increase and complete um, the integration in terms of systems and um, operations. Uh, the last point has to do with the CLIG board itself. Um, just after closing, uh, both George Carpus and Dan Lippincott were appointed to the CLIG board. Uh, George Carpus becomes a non-independent, non-executive director, and Dan Lippincott as an executive at, at Carpus becomes an executive director. And as I mentioned earlier, he is the CIO at Kim. On, on slide 10, I really just wanted to sort of focus on uh, sort of the evolution um, of the business uh, in terms of the various strategies. And uh, if you look at that last column, 31st December 20, uh, that shows you the breakdown by CLIG AUM uh, of uh, the two um, operating entities. And where I would really focus is that, of course, we've really been aiming at diversifying away from emerging markets. You know, the volatility of that asset class historically has meant that uh, CLIG has been uh, really dependent on those, those emerging market cycles. Um, so we went from at the end of June of 20, almost a 70% um, AUM uh, in EM uh, in terms of the group to now just under 50% at 47%. And I think that you know we will continue to try to diversify away, uh, and that's one of the benefits of of this transaction with Carpus, uh, and that their underlying assets are much more focused on fixed income uh, and U.S. equities. So it moves us again away from EM. And then secondly, I would just point out that under the international uh, line item there, the growth obviously of that um, over the last three years has been tremendous, uh, growing from just under 500 million in AUM to 1.7 billion today. 
Uh, and again, that remains an area of growth for the for the for the business on the Clem side, and that's something that we want to continue to to push forward on. I'll now pass over to Mark Dwyer. Um, so. Slide 11 really just shows us the, the flows across the business for the last three and a half years. Um, as you can see, we've, we've you know, had really strong growth in the international and opportunistic value strategies. Uh, and that's really, as Carlos was saying, in line with our, our, our long-term corporate objectives to diversify. Um, I think the pressure points have really been in frontier where demand for the asset class has has really just collapsed in the last couple of years. Um, but I would bear in mind that, um, you know, that's never been more than than, than roughly 2% of our assets. Um, we've also you know, had some outflows in emerging markets where, where we really have had more of a capacity constraint. Um, so this is a snapshot of our, of our key strategies performance uh, and the peer group charts go back five years, which is really what our institutional clients deem to be a measurable investment horizon. Um, and it's important to note that these charts cover you know, over 95% of CLIM assets and, and over two thirds of Carpus's assets. Um, it, you know, these are five year charts, but when we look back at 2020, it was really a good year for performance overall, uh, eventually. So we were able to exploit pretty significant discount volatility in closed end funds through the early and, and mid parts of the year, particularly in late Q1 and early Q2. Um, that's when we saw you know, pretty significant retail panic selling and that pushed discounts on, on funds out to multi-year wide levels across you know, most segments of the market. Um, and then we saw very strong markets in the back end of the year. And for example, emerging markets were up roughly 20% in, in the fourth quarter alone. Uh, and that pushed discounts back to more or less where they were at the end of 2019. So, you know, overall, it was a really good environment with that discount volatility um, for the firm. Um, NAV performance last year. So that's the performance of the underlying closed end funds in, in, in which we invest was also positive. So you know, overall, I'd say it was a good year for active management, especially for closed end funds. And I think, you know, we can say that the volatility we saw um, was perfectly suited for the closed end fund structure. So they weren't forced sellers uh, into the market declines in the first and second quarters. Uh, and they were really able to capture the upside um, that we saw in the second part of the year. Um, so, you know, so overall, we had good contributions from both discounts and, and net asset values, and they were the key drivers of, of performance. Um, so, so what we saw in 2020 in terms of performance puts about 95% of our managed assets into uh, the first or second quartile over five years. Uh, and that's a really good base for client retention and organic asset growth. Um, in terms of the growth focus, uh, it's always going to be on our core competencies. Um, and, and right now the focus will be on our international and, and opportunistic value closed end fund strategies. Um, both have excellent performance, uh, both have ample capacity for further institutional flows. Um, so, so that's positive for those two strategies. And then I think looking further out, the REIT team that we took on in 2018 and subsequently seeded have generated really good results as well. Uh, I think for obvious reasons, REIT as an asset class wasn't the ideal place to be in 2020, um, but looking forward, the outlook post pandemic is, I think especially for the EM REIT asset class, very favorable. Um, so we've seen REIT prices you know, really dislocated from the real estate physical fundamentals uh, and they offer a significant yield. Um, and then especially on the emerging market side, the, you know, the solid long-term structural trends certainly haven't gone away. Um, so that's you know, emerging market urbanization and, and the growth of, of the middle classes, um, which are really multi-decade tailwinds for the asset class overall. Um, and then at Carpus, the, the new marketing resource there will be increasingly targeting uh, RIA. Um, that's a registered investment advisor channel. Um, so those are groups that are looking to outsource the asset management for their clients. Uh, and, and with the excellent performance that we've seen generated by the team at Carpus over the last five years, we'd expect that initiative to be um, very successful indeed. Um, so that really concludes the main part of the presentation. Um, the appendices cover income statements and some other financial data. 
Um, but I think to summarize, you know, the integration of Carpus is well on track. Uh, our investment products navigated 2020 very well and have delivered good long-term investment performance. Um, so we have a strong base uh, in, in the short to medium term for, for net flows. Um, and that's especially the case in our international and opportunistic strategies uh, and also via the new marketing channels at Carpus. Um, so that's the end of the presentation. I'll hand back to Keith for Q&A. Thanks, thanks for that. Uh, we've had quite a lot of questions in actually, so I'm going to combine some and we may not be able to get to all of them in the time that we've got. So the first one's a, a pretty broad one, which is from Liang, which is the outlook for uh, long-term sustainable organic growth. Tom. I, I can take that one, Keith. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, I, I think that as Tom said in the presentation, and I think that the rationale, obviously, for looking at uh, a merger ultimately uh, was to ensure that we could continue to grow. Now, obviously, we are uh, our investment approach is is specialized. It, it's it's a niche approach, and we need to manage the capacity carefully. But at the same time, we believe that we can have the same kind of success as a group uh, in the wealth management space in the United States as, as we've had in the institutional space in the United States. So from our perspective, we're really focused on putting in place um, the necessary resources to make the team at Carpus from a, from a, from a fund center management standpoint and a marketing standpoint successful. Mark mentioned that we're in the process of hiring um, a marketing uh, executive at Carpus. Historically, um, that's something that um, you know most of the business at Carpus has historically been via client referral. They've had very good performance, and so the referral processes work quite well. Um, but we also believe that um, there is room to grow um, that channel in terms of registered investment advisors, of which are about 13,000 in the United States. And some estimates are that as much as half of them don't actually manage money for their clients. They're simply selling them someone else's product. And so we think that Carpus can be quite successful in providing those managers with the ability to, um, to manage um, you know, money for them uh, because of their um, superior long-term track record. Um, while we don't focus directly on a growth rate, I think what we're hoping for is to maintain our historical growth rates. And that's really what we're all sort of focused on. I think that, as Mark mentioned, we're also, uh, in terms of the Klim investment team, making sure that uh, we continue to grow the international strategy. We've got a lot of room in the opportunistic value strategy. And that strategy now is coming up on consultants' radars because it's generated a five-year track record. And over time, we think the REIT strategy will also be successful, but it needs another year at least in order to have a three-year track record, which is the minimum to begin to grow profile with consultants. Thank you. The second question comes from Maynard and, and actually explores the issue of uh, capacity. Um, so Maynard saying that the preceding full year 2020 results mentioned the capacity constrained emerging market universe and an objective of keeping uh, EM fund under management at $4 billion. Uh, they now surpass $5 billion. So how's the management coping with capacity issue at present? Uh, will the investment returns in emerging markets suffer? Uh, and is extra money from in the EM space being accepted from clients? Yeah, I, I can say that one, Keith. Um, you know, function is a capacity of the universe size. And... Yeah, as markets move around, so all else equal, the universe grows and or shrinks, and so does our capacity. Um, you know, the the emerging market index is up, you know, over thirty percent. I think in, in the last six months, maybe thirty five percent. So, um, for example, if our capacity was 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 four billion six months ago, then it's uh, close to the five and a half billion now. So, so the bottom line, I think capacity as an absolute dollar value is only a snapshot in time. Um, and it needs to be thought of that way. Um, it, you know, in terms of coping ca with capacity, we're coping just fine. Um, you know, on the emerging market side, we're not accepting significant size new mandates. 
um, but existing clients can certainly and 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 they do top up uh, and, and we're also taking you know smaller size mandates from from new clients and i and i just reiterate again you know it has been a corporate objective for some time for for click to diversify uh, and, and as we said throughout this presentation, and Carlos just made the point as well, you know, the international opportunistic value strategies have great track records, um, significant capacity, uh, and, and therefore a really good runway for growth. Thank you. So whereas one investor is worrying about the capacity, uh, the next <laughs> investor is worrying about generating, uh, generating growth. So the company is a loyal client basis. Uh, base, but uh, seems to struggle to win further large mandates or has struggled to win further large mandates over the past few years. What scope is there for improved marketing or operations to generate secular growth? That, that comes from Mark. And I'll roll that into another question um, that asks about um, what changes will management implement to attract greater new client funds under management? Sure. Thank you, Keith. I'll, I'll take that. Well, I, I guess I would say that um, if you look at slide 11, where we had the um, the international uh, strategy there, and that strategy has gone from pretty much zero to just over one and a half billion uh, in AUM. So I, I'd like to believe that we actually have raised some money. Um, so I'd start there. Uh, I, I think the bigger question is that, you know, in this environment, what are the types of things that, that a firm can do to try to attract assets? And I think the very first thing, and certainly our firm has always been focused on that is performance. We need to put the numbers up. And I think both at Kim and at Clem, that is the priority. So we're all working together to support the investment management teams to do that. Secondly, we continue to build profile through, in terms of Clem, the consultant channel. And that is getting products through the research teams at the consultant doing what we say we're going to do, ensuring that they understand the process, ensuring that we keep the teams together and the numbers then get us to the point where after at least three years, you can be considered for inclusion on a buy list and you can begin to be included for mandate searches. And that's something that our marketing team has done very well. Um, so in terms of what's going on at Carpus, historically, they didn't have an integrated marketing function. So we think we can help them with that. And they're very excited to start looking at um, you know, raising their profile in the RAA channel. They manage money for RAA. So this isn't a new area, but in the last sort of 10 to 15 years, they really haven't been pushing um, that channel. They haven't been increasing their profile. And despite the fact they have excellent investment performance. So again, we think that this new hire on the marketing front there will, will definitely set them up to be successful, but that's gonna take some time. So that's something that we are working on. And then I think separately, what we're trying to do is that, you know, we need to be focused, not so much on trying to sell products, but on trying to ensure that the, the, the profile is there. We raise the profile, we have different events, we get in front of consultants, we get in front of other prospects, and that the investment performance is ultimately what sells the product. Uh, so that's really where we're focused. Carlos, I suspect the next one's for you as well, which is a follow-up on, on Kim, uh, which is around uh, asking for a bit more color on the driver of the outflows that have been since the merger. Are these expected to reverse now? Uh, uh, now there's an ability to market across a combined client base. Well, the short answer is we hope so. Um, and we are confident that we can help them improve um, and in fact, really create um, a stronger marketing presence. Um, at the same time, I think that if you look at um, December 31st and um, you saw so obviously some flows coming out uh, both on the, the Clem side and Mark noted the, the frontier um, strategy and some of the problems it's faced. Um, I think on the Carpus side, there were sort of two factors. One is that you have to understand that this is a wealth management business uh, in terms of the underlying clients, and some of those clients need their wealth to live on. Uh, they're retirees, and so the end of the year is a natural time to take some money off the table and you know, bank some, some, uh, some, some dollars for the next year uh, in terms of living expenses, et cetera. 
Um, secondly, there were uh, a couple of uh, defined, so legacy defined benefit pension funds that became fully funded. And so those, the plan sponsors of those funds effectively closed those funds. And so those funds were lost to Carpus. And this is something that's happened in the United States uh, quite frequently now. Uh, you see it across a number of different sectors where these legacy funds, at the point they're fully funded, the employer simply shuts them down. Uh, so I think those are the two things going on there. The other, you know, the, the final bit, obviously last year, the market uh, ran pretty quickly, um, pretty hard, pretty quickly. And ultimately, uh, you did have some rebalancing taking place. Um, and I think that's a, that's a natural thing, uh, you know, when the U.S. market is up as, 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 as much as it was. And I think that that's something that you just have to expect. The, mo the more important thing is to ensure that the marketing is, is again, in place to replace those assets. Um, that's the key uh, point, really, from our perspective. Thanks. I think the next question is probably for Mark, which, uh, which is around uh, the REIT seed strategy. You've talked about that already, uh, asking how it's performed after a, a turbulent uh, 2020 mark. Yeah, well, I, the, you know, the investor base that, that we're targeting, so the institutional US investors are really looking for relative performance. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, it wasn't a great year overall for, for REITs in, in 2020 for obvious reasons. Um, but the team that, that we have have put up really good results. Um, so you know, the EM product was ahead of its benchmark by over 300 basis points. And I think the international product was ahead by somewhere in the region of 800 basis points. Um, so they did really well in, in what was you know, a really, I would say, challenging environment for, for REIT investors in 2020. Um, and, and that builds on, on the performance that we saw in 2019, which was a much better environment um, for, for REIT investors. Um, so they've done well. They've done well in an up year and, and they've done well in a down year. And I think you know, that's the key. It sets up the, the strategy for you know, sustainable growth. Um, at the point that it's got its three-year track record, and we're only you know, 10, 11 months away from that now, um, where we'll be able to take this product to you know, institutions and consultants in the US and, uh, and, and, and get it to grow. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're very pleased with the strategy and the performance that they've, um, that they've put in that team. Uh, we've now got a question around, uh, around investment strategy from Pam in this changing world. Do you have a mandatory timescale for holding stocks or do circumstances dictate an operational approach to management? Um, yeah, I, I'm, I, I'm not really sure what's meant by an operational approach to management. Um, we, we don't have a mandatory timescale at all for, for holding a stock. I, I mean, historically, our turnover has been in the range of 20 to 30 percent. Um, and you know, so you could say our investment horizon on the back of that is th is three to five years, because that's what you know, that that equals twenty or thirty percent a, a year. Um, but our investment process is heavily dependent on on discounts and and discount value. So, you know, if if we purchase a position on the basis that we think that discount is wide and and we expect it to contract over time, um, you know, time is the very variable element in in that in that equation so if the discount comes in and, and and meets our target earlier than expected then um you know if we exit the whole position then we could be out of that in, in a much shorter time frame than three to five years um so i'd say overall the average is 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 um is three to five years but it can be considerably shorter um, and that really depends on discount volatility Okay, the next question is is around a technical issue, uh, 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 an act in the US called the Increasing Investor Opportunities Act, it comes from William, who asks, does the management think that this proposed uh, act will have an impact on how they invest in US closed end funds? Um, perhaps you could explain uh, briefly what that is for the rest of the audience. Yeah, I, I mean, that's a really sort of technical question. Um, I mean, I think that that particular bill, you know, it didn't it didn't part. It was introduced in the last Congress. It it, it wasn't enacted. But I, and I, as I understand it, you know, 90, 95 percent of bills don't become law in the U.S. And, and it certainly looks like this one won't become law going forward. So I, I think that bill is is dead. Um, but, I, you know, I, 
in any event, our, our strategy relies on discount volatility. Um, you know, we engage with boards, uh, I think like all institutional investors do. Uh, and indeed, that's one of our responsibilities as, as stewards of our clients' capital. Um, and, and I think that particular bill was ostensibly introduced to allow US in particular closed end funds to, to invest more money in, in private assets, which is probably a good thing. Um, but the bringing, it, yeah, even if that bill did pass, and, and I say again, I think it's dead now, um, you know, that wouldn't prevent or, or, or detract from the engagement that, that we have with boards. And um, you know, I think importantly, nor would it prevent us from, from generating the alpha that we do from, from trading discount volatility. Thank you. Now, moving on subjects, uh, we've got a question here from Sam about the uh, current regulatory capital requirement. So what is it? Does the board think that the company has excess capital at present? Um, I'll take that, Keith. Um, uh, obviously, there's only one entity within the group, which is the UK operating entity, which is IFCA regulated entity and requires capital. And as we've been disclosing in our um, annual report, yes, we carry, uh, we have a policy of carrying almost two times capital and we maintain uh, two times regulatory capital for, for the UK entity. Uh, there's no capital requirements for the Kim uh, Carpus entity and obviously Click doesn't have any other capital requirements. Thank you. That leads nicely into what I'm afraid will have to be the last question in the time that we've got allocated today. Uh, which is from Mark again, significant cash balances are building up. How should we view the likelihood of a special dividend in 2021? There are many investors obviously in uh, City of London Investment Group because it's been a phenomenal dividend payer. It's still got a very high yield despite, uh, despite that tremendous track record. So I think it's probably one for you, Tom. Yeah, I'll take that one, Keith. Um... I think uh, the, the direct short answer to that is that we don't currently have plans to have another special dividend in 2021. Um, you may recall that in uh, fiscal year end 2019, we had a special dividend paid out. And we did that because we had significant cash buildup and we uh, were not in a position to um, have um, to utilize that cash for um, further diversification. And so, you know, we find ourselves in a position where we just uh, did a merger. Um, we had built up our cash balances, um, knowing that we wanted to do further diversification. And it just happened that it, it, it worked out as an all share deal. Um, since that time, markets have been on a tear, a run up considerably. And, and I think that at the moment, um, it, it's a prudent idea to have significant cash reserves on hand. Number one, you know, our business is um, really, um, it's really needed to retain our staff because really at the end of the day, all we have is people. And that's what our clients buy into is our people and our investment management team. And that investment management team is the, is the team that creates the outperformance. Um, and we, we, we already run a pretty lean ship. And so you know, it's not as if we have a lot of overhead of extra staff wandering around the offices that we can just let go. Um, you know, between the, um, the number of offices that we have, we, we now have a total of, of 100 employees. So it, it's not as if we've, we've got an, uh, a glut of additional staff. In addition, you know, with this significant market run up, um, uh, we don't want to be in a position should the markets turn on us to have to decrease our, our dividend ultimately. Uh, I think that would be a very bad sign to the market. And um, we, we do at the moment, and one of the bigger things that um, you know, we're thinking about is that we wanna continue to keep our options open relative to further potential diversification that may be coming along. Um, I guess that what I would say though, um, is that we, we are well aware of the need, and we've shown it uh, as recently as two years ago, of the need to return capital to shareholders um, with all things being equal. Tom, gents, thank you very much for that uh, comprehensive uh, presentation Q&A session. I'm conscious we didn't get to ask all the questions that have been submitted, but um, we'll try and get those answered uh, 
after the event by the management. Can I say once again, thank you very much for, uh, for the time of the audience and for the time of uh, City of London Investment uh, Group. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.